right, two songs about the New Jerusalem there, so I trust that's encouraging to you. We're going to open our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 15, if you would, tonight, tonight, this afternoon, getting used to that, 1 Samuel 15. Before we look at that, let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we come to you very needy, in need of your blessing today as we read your word, study it together. We need you to speak to us. Lord, we need you to make your presence known and felt. And Lord, most of all, we need to see you as you are and be changed by our time in your word. Pray that you would give me the filling of your Holy Spirit. I pray that um, you would give us ears to hear what you have for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We, several weeks ago, began by introducing a journey we're going to take through the life of David. And if you think about uh, characters in Scripture about whom we know the most, it would be David. Uh, Up there with, I mean, we know a lot about Jesus, but we do not have as many, um, Jesus did not write uh, things in the sense of the Psalms and things. Um, obviously, he inspired all of Scripture. But um, David is one of the most prolific um, writers of Scripture and the most well-known characters of Scripture. We're going to take just a journey through his life, and I trust it will be a blessing to you. Um, as I study his life, I am always challenged and, and convicted uh, by many things. And so I trust it will be a blessing. We looked at um, last time we... Uh, considered this together, we were in Acts 13, and we read this verse in Acts 13, verse 22, which is a synopsis of David's life. And Paul is preaching to a group of unbelievers here, and he says that uh, God raised up kings for Israel. He raised up Saul, of, of, uh, and he removed him, Acts 13, 22, and he says, and he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. Now that is in the New Testament. That's in Acts 13, 22. That is a quotation from 1 Samuel 13, 13 and 14. And the man who heard those words was the man who would be replaced by David, King Saul. And he was being rebuked by the prophet Samuel, in 1 Samuel 13, 13 and 14, and we'll get there in a little bit. But it's interesting that Saul was the one to hear those words first. And to fully understand David's life, King David's life, we need to understand a little bit about Saul's life, the king he replaced, and the king with whom he had so much to do in his early life. And I'm calling this message Saul's Upside-Down Journey to the Top. Uh, There is a song that I learned years ago in Patch the Pirate Club. Maybe some of you know it. The lyrics go like this. God says the biggest is often quite small. God says the greatest is the servant of all. You must go downward to come out at the top. Follow man's logic and you'll be a flop. Upside down, upside down, inside out, inside out. Die to live, die to live. And to get, you've got to give. To be rich, you must be poor. Give away if you want more. Impossible? Not really. Absurd? Check God's word. Just take a look around and you'll find this world is upside down. And that is Saul's life. It's upside down. He journeyed to the top and at the end of his life he finds out that he's actually at the bottom. And I want you to see in 1 Samuel 15, 17, this is a key verse that I'm going to come back to a couple times here. 1 Samuel 15, 17 and we'll get into the context of it later, but I just want to show it to you first. First Samuel 15, 17, Samuel says to Saul, When you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? That phrase, when you were little in your own eyes. 
is very, very significant for Saul. Saul began when he was little in his own eyes. But now, what is Samuel implying about Saul? I want you to, it's after lunch. I was threatened by two people that I have to keep this interesting. And I will not name those two transgressors, but uh, they, uh, they threatened me to keep this. In. So what is he implying about Saul at this point? He says, when you were little in your own eyes, you were this way. But what's he implying? Too big for his britches. Okay, um, Too big. Uh, for himself. He is too big in his own eyes. He's too large. He's conceited. Okay? And that's the implication. We will follow Saul's path from the bottom to the top or the top to the bottom, depending on how you look at it. And we're going to see here that God uses people that are small in their own eyes. That's the secret to Saul's life. That's the secret to your life. God uses people that are small in their own eyes. 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 29. You can flip over there if you turn fast. I'll read it to you here. It says, But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen. It doesn't mean those things are, are, are stupid. Those people are stupid. They're not stupid. They're not foolish. But the world thinks they're foolish. And the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised. God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. God uses people that are small in their own eyes. And we're going to see, we're going to take Saul's life and I'm going to do a brief overview of it, several chapters here, and just hit the highlights. And we divided it into four different points. The first point begins when he's small in his own eyes. We find him in 1 Samuel 8. If you go over there, 1 Samuel 8, verse 1. We find him as a son searching for donkeys. A son searching for donkeys. It's our first stop in Saul's life. 1 Samuel 8, verse 1. This is Israel coming to, to Samuel. And if you know your Israel history, um, you have Israel coming into the promised land. They conquer the territory of the promised land in the book of Joshua. End of Joshua, they're divided up. They're scattered through the promised land. And their tribes are taking over their different allotments. And in the book of Judges, the chapter turns... And Israel forgets the Lord, essentially, for a number of years. And there's this wicked cycle that continues over and over and over. Of They fall into sin. God sends them into uh, exile, into judgment. There, there are territories that come in and uh, foreign enemies that come in and torment them. And they call out to the Lord. God sends a judge. Israel turns back to the Lord. God delivers them. And then they fall into sin again. And it happens numerous times. And in college, we had to memorize the uh, judges and there's a number of them that just go right down the line um, and ending with the most famous judge of all Samson but really the last judge was a man named Samuel and he judged Israel he was sort of a he spanned that generation of the judges the time of the judges into the time of the kings and he is a prophet as well but he judges Israel and they come to him in chapter 8 of 1 Samuel, and it came to pass, verse 1, when Samuel was old, that he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of the firstborn was Joel, and the name of the second, Abijah. These were judges in Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, that was his hometown, and said to him, Look, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people and all they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. And 
Israel wants a king like all the other nations. They do not listen to Samuel as he goes and he explains to them. God instructs him in the rest of this passage to tell them what the king will do, how he'll tax them. Verse 19 of chapter 8 says, Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, No, but we will have a king over us, that we may also be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. They wanted to be like all the other nations. Then you have in chapter 9, this father who sends his son um, searching for some donkeys that had run away, and the Man's name is Kish. His son is Saul. We're told his son was very good looking. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. And he goes and he is searching high and low for these donkeys. They must have been very hard to find because uh, it took him a long time. He had to, had to go all over the place looking for them and he never actually found them. Um, but God was leading him to meet up with Samuel. And he meets up with Samuel, uh, who is called the seer in this passage. And he's, Samuel is offering a sacrifice and he tells Saul, uh, when they meet him, Saul and this servant, look at verse uh, 19, um, so, uh, uh, 1 Samuel 9, 19. Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place for you shall eat with me today and tomorrow I will let you go and will tell you all that is in your heart. But as for the donkeys that were lost three days ago, Not be anxious about them, for they have been found. And look at this statement. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on you and on all your father's house? And Saul's answer to this is very telling. Look at how he estimates himself. And Saul answered and said, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? And my family, the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then do you speak like this to me? What is Saul's estimation of himself at this point? I'm the smallest of the small. Why are you talking to me? Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin had almost been extinguished completely in Israel. If you read the end of the book of Judges, it's a disgusting thing that happened um, in in more ways than one. But uh, Benjamin, because of their perverted nature, was just about extinguished from Israel And the way that they actually bring Benjamin back is just unbelievable. But it fits right in with the time period of the judges. um, Because the people were not seeking after God at all. But as uh, as, as Samuel commends Saul and he says, You're on whom is all all the desire of Israel. Is it not on you and on your father's house? He's commending Saul. And Saul's response to that commendation is, hey, you're talking to someone who is the least family of the least of the tribes of Israel. And I believe that he meant that. He he was not large in his own eyes. If you're not convinced, I want you to see, um, we'll go from the the son searching for donkeys to uh, the second point here. Uh, Samuel anoints him king over Israel and tells him, Uh, what the Lord is going to do, and some time passes. And we find in chapter 10, verse 21, that they were going to present Saul to the people of Israel. I'm going pretty quickly here through the history. We're not going to get into every detail. Verse 21 of chapter 10 of 1 Samuel. People are together again. Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, and the tribe of Benjamin had been chosen. And when he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the, tribe, the family of Matri was chosen, and Saul, the son of Kish, was chosen. But when they sought him, he could not be found. So picture this. The nominating committee, okay, the, the, the political situation, you know, the... The political convention is happening and they've just nominated somebody and they say, and the nominee for this year is, and the curtain goes up and there's nobody there. And they're like, where is Saul, son of Kish? He can't be hard to find because he's a head taller than everybody else. Anybody seen this big, tall guy anywhere? And they can't find him. And they sought him. He could not be found. Verse 22, therefore they inquired of the Lord further, has the man come here yet? And the Lord, Jehovah himself, has to tell them, There he is, hidden among the equipment. 
Go backstage underneath the microphones and all of this stuff and you will find him. It's actually the military equipment that he's hiding among. And God says, go back there and you'll find him. So they ran, verse 23, and brought him from there. And when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And Samuel said to all the people, do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? That there is no one like him among all the people. So all the people shouted and said, long live the king. Why did Saul hide? Trying to bring out the point here. What, what, is, what is he doing? He's not proud. He's little in his own eyes. He's overwhelmed. That's the second thing we need to see. From a son in search of donkeys, he is now the overwhelmed king of Israel. And he doesn't know how to handle it because he's small in his own eyes. He's anointed king in 1051 B.C. And he was old enough at this point, if you put all of the references together in in 1 Samuel 13, you'll find that he had a son named Jonathan who very early on in his reign, it seems, was leading in the military. So Saul was not this young, you know, barely 20-something. He was probably 30s, 40s. Uh, at this time period in his life. This is 1051 B.C. He's old enough to have a grown son in the military. David is, a, is going to be born 10 years after Saul is, is uh, crowned king of Israel in 1041 B.C. So Saul is considerably older than David, as is Jonathan. Saul unifies these people, though, in response to the dangers that are surrounding them. If you go to chapter 11 you see this conflict that comes up. I want to point out, first of all, the end of chapter 10. Not everyone wanted Saul to be king. Verse 27, some rebels said, How can this man save us? So they despised him and brought him no presents. But he held his peace. He wasn't going to make trouble. And he was a humble young man, or middle-aged man, we'll say. Um, He's a humble man. And this conflict happens in Chapter 11, verses 1 through 15. And I want you to see the uh, nature of the conflict is Nahash the Ammonite comes and he encamps against Jabesh Gilead. And people of that city were used to giving in. People of Israel were used to giving in to these, to these enemies. Um, you have instances of this in the book of Judges. They tell Samson, they say, Samson, don't you know that the Philistines are rulers over us? We need to bind you and take you to to them. You remember the story? And they bind him with these cords. And as they bring him out to the Philistines, he breaks the cords. But don't forget that the Israelites actually bound their own champion and led him to their captors. And so it happens again that in, uh, in this time period, the Ammonites come and they encamp against Jabesh Gilead. And they say to them, make a covenant with us and we'll serve you. Nahash the Ammonite says to them, On this condition I will make a covenant with you, that I may put out all your right eyes and bring reproach on all Israel. How does that sound? Do you guys, would you guys sign on to that? And they're like, well, just a second. Let us think about it. Give us seven days and we'll see what we can come up with here. And they, say, they send to King Saul and say, you need to help us. And Saul uh, sends word to all of the people and In verse 6, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Saul when he heard this news, and his anger was greatly aroused. So he took a yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces and sent them throughout all the territory of Israel by the hands of messengers, saying, Whoever does not go out with who? Saul and Samuel to battle, so it shall be done to his oxen. Notice those words, Saul and Samuel. It wasn't about Saul. It was about something bigger. He was about the, the safety of Israel. He was about the cause of the Lord. And Samuel played into that. Notice the words Saul and Samuel. And all the people come up, they unite, and he utterly defeats the Ammonites. You can read the story there in the rest of the chapter. And then, in flush with this victory... Some people come up to him. So it was the next day that Saul put the people in three companies. I'm ahead of my, or behind myself here. Let's go to um, 
verse 12. Then the people said to Samuel, Who is he who said, Saul shall reign, shall Saul reign over us? Basically, Saul won't reign over us. Bring the men that we may put them to death. So he's, he's, uh, he's killed these Ammonites and, and he's destroyed them. And now they've all come together again and everybody's like really charged up about their new king. He's just defeated the Ammonites. And these people... I think they were probably worked in the media of that time period. They said, Saul, how do you feel about those people who don't support you as king? And they said, we think we should kill them right now. What do you think? And he's, you know, he's got a golden opportunity to annihilate all of his political opponents. And he says to them, not a man shall be put to death this day. For today the Lord has accomplished salvation in Israel. What does that say to you? What does that say about his character? He's not in it for himself. He's not in it for political fame yet. He's not about himself. He's small in his own eyes. He's the overwhelmed king of Israel. And he responds graciously to his political enemies. They renew the kingdom in the rest of this chapter. And Samuel confronts them very pointedly about their rebellion against the Lord once again. And they repent for this and they say, please entreat the Lord for us because we have sinned. And in verse 20 of of chapter 12, Samuel said to the people, do not fear. You have done all this wickedness, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart and do not turn aside. For then who could, for then you could go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver, for they are nothing. For the Lord will not forsake His people for His great name's sake. Verse 24, Only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart. For consider what great things He has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. Solemn words as he confronts the people there and they repent of their sin. But notice that God doesn't take away their king. He says, fear the Lord, serve him in truth with all your heart, you and your king. And they do for a time. But then we turn and we find in chapter 13, the timing of this, we're not exactly sure. Uh, Verse 1 is a little bit uh, cryptic there. Saul reigned one year and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose for himself 3,000 men. I believe the timing is a little different there. But Saul is now turning to an impulsive politician. It's very sad to see. Look in verse 3. Jonathan attacked the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. Then Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let all the Hebrews hear. So what you have here is Saul and Jonathan are initiating contact with the Philistines, And the Philistines, we think of, when we think of Philistines, who do you think of? Okay, Goliath. Goliath was probably the most famous Philistine. Philistines live down by the Mediterranean Sea, the southwest side of uh, the territory of Israel. That's where we think of Philistines because you have Gath and you have Ashdod and you have Gaza and you have um, Ashkelon and these other cities down there. Those were all Philistine cities. And Goliath obviously was from Gath. That was his hometown We think of them as sort of bottled up down there. Well, in the time of the judges and in the time of the kings even, until the time period of David, Philistines were exploded all over what is now uh, Israel. You think of Israel as that that area along the Jordan River, Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. Philistines had garrisons all over the place. Uh, They had a garrison in Geba, which is in the northern portion of Israel, or the central portion of Israel, excuse me. And they also had a garrison, we're told, uh, 2 Samuel, David uh, references the garrison at Bethlehem. There was a Philistine garrison at Bethlehem at one point because the Philistines had overrun these people. The Philistines had control over Israel to a great degree. If you look down in verses 16 through 23, we're not going to read them, but you can see that the Israelites, when they wanted an axe sharpened, Guess where they had to go? To the Philistines. They didn't have any swords. They couldn't have swords. The Philistines wouldn't sharpen swords. And only Saul and his son Jonathan had a sword. 
You would presume that they had like bows and arrows and other improvised weapons, but that was how bad it was. You don't think of Philistine as bottled up down in the southwestern portion. Think of Philistines as just occupying Israel at this point. And what does Saul and Jonathan do? Verse 3, they go and attack the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard it. You ever mess with a bee's nest before? We were working on our house the past several weeks, and up under the eave, there was this wasp nest. I think I killed 26 or 27 bees out of the wasp nest. I used up two cans of the, that good old raid stuff, sprayed the living daylights out of those things. And, uh, but you mess with the bees' nest, and they're coming after you. And that's what these people do. They've poked the, the hornet's nest here. And the Philistines are coming after them. And it, you get the sense of the terror that that strikes. Saul is blowing this trumpet throughout all the land, says, Let the Hebrews hear. Now all Israel heard it said that Saul had attacked a garrison of the Philistines and that Israel had also become an abomination to the Philistines. And the people were called together to Saul at Gilgal. And there is great consternation the Philistines are planning this huge onslaught, and they're, the people are scared. Verse, um, verse 5, Then the Philistines gathered together to fight with Israel 30,000 chariots. you got to have somebody to drive the chariots. So that's a lot, a lot of people. And 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and encamped in Michmash to the east of Beth Haven. When the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, for the people were distressed, and that people hid in caves, in thickets, in rocks, in holes, and in pits. And some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. So you have these people that are literally trembling as they walk around after their king. Some are not trembling. They're in the mud, in the pits, having been covered up. Some are in ditches. Some are in caves. Some are in the thickets. And some have said, you know, forget it. We're going across the Jordan. You guys let us know when this is all over. And they're over in Gilead. They don't want anything to do with this. Saul's under some pressure at this point. And it says in verse 8, that he was waiting for someone. He wanted to meet with Samuel. Before he would go into a battle, he would meet with Samuel. Then he waited seven days, verse 8, according to the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul said, Bring a burnt offering and peace offerings here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Now it happened as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering that Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him that he might greet him. So there was this set time, and you can read about it in chapter 10, verse 8. This was not the only time that Samuel had set this uh, for Saul. This was an understanding, and you'll see this. Uh, Samuel is going to ask him in verse 11. Samuel said, What have you done? Saul said, When I saw that the people were scattered from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered together at Michmash, then I said, The Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. Now, where's your sympathy? Can you, do you feel for Saul or do you feel for Samuel? How many feel for Saul right now? Okay, some bold people. I, I tempted to feel for Saul. Like, seven days? Like, we just poked a hornet's nest, now we have to wait seven days. Hope we don't get stung, you know. And, uh, but it's a test. And we don't, we're not told all the details, but it's a test. Saul says, I felt like I had to. That's what compelled means. I felt like I had to. Have you ever used those words? I, felt, I just felt I had to do this. Felt compelled. Verse 13, And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he, had, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. This was a test. This was one of those times where God said like to Abraham, Hey, take your son, yeah, your only son, 
whom you love and go and offer him as a burnt sacrifice on the, on the uh, mountains of Moriah. Just go do that. And Abraham goes and he starts to carry it out and God withholds him from carrying that out. But he says to Abraham after that, now I know that you love me more than anything. And this was a test for Saul. Are you going to disobey God's word? Are you going to give in to what's convenient and what you feel compelled to do? And Saul gave in to what he felt compelled to do. He said, I feel like I had to do it. And Samuel rebukes him for this. And this is where Samuel says, the Lord has searched out for himself a man after his own heart. And Samuel emphasizes that Saul's treatment of God's words was what was the problem. You have not kept the, Lord, the word of the Lord your God. Verse 14, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be a commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And after Samuel departs, the battle goes on. And the hero of the day is Jonathan. He goes and attacks this garrison of the Philistines. And the garrison, he overcomes it. Just him and his armor bearer, two against several hundred men. And the Philistines turn and they're routed. And it's an amazing, amazing feat uh, that the Lord accomplishes and honors faith. And there's all kinds of application that we can take from that. But during this time, amazingly, after being rebuked by Samuel, Saul, Samuel leaves and there's this awkward silence probably between the two of them. And Samuel leaves and then Saul finds out later that, that uh, the Philistines have been routed. And he begins to chase after these Philistines. We see this in chapter 14. And... Um, Saul places the people, if you look in verse 24 of chapter 14, he places the people under oath to not eat until he had avenged himself of his enemies. Look at this in verse 24. And the men of Israel were distressed that day. So this is, I want to be clear, um, Saul has been rebuked by Samuel. Right after that, Jonathan goes and attacks the garrison of the Philistines and God gives a victory to Jonathan Saul jumps in and he starts chasing these people. Now we're coming to, to verse 24. This, the men of Israel were distressed that day as they pursue the Philistines. They say, for, the, for Saul had placed the people under oath saying, Cursed is the man who eats any food until evening before I have taken vengeance on my enemies. Cursed is the man who eats any food until evening before I have taken vengeance on my enemies. Note his language. Whose enemies are they? They're mine. And Jonathan, wouldn't you know it, is running through the woods and he sees some honey on the ground and he eats the honey and he's starving to death. He doesn't know about the oath. He eats the honey and he perks up and he finds out about this oath and they say, Jonathan, you shouldn't have done that. Why did you do that? The king's placed this. And Jonathan is just forthright and he says in verse 29, Jonathan said, my father has troubled the land. Look now how my countenance has brightened because I tasted a little of this honey. How much better if the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies which they found. For now would there not have been a much greater slaughter among the Philistines? And so Jonathan is honest here and he says, I, My father's troubled the land. And to make a long story short, in verse 37 through 46, they come back together and Saul is asking a question of the Lord, and the Lord won't answer him. And the Lord eventually points out that someone has broken the oath. And it comes to be Jonathan. And Saul says to Jonathan, he says, you are going to die today because you've broken the oath that I caused everyone to swear. What does that say? about this man. Something's changing in him. Something is changing. And I believe that in this situation, God is pointing out just this bumbling type of uh, uh, impulsive leadership of his father. He doesn't think about what he's saying. Um, 
And we could argue whether or not Saul should have paid this vow or what. I don't think that's the point. I think Jonathan had to be delivered from the foolishness of his father. And the men of Israel uh, step up and they say at the end of this chapter, verse 46, um, verse 45, But the people said to Saul, Shall Jonathan die? who has accomplished this great deliverance in Israel? Certainly not. As the Lord lives, not one hair of his head shall fall to the ground, for he has worked with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan, and he did not die. Rescued from whom? Not the Philistines, but his own father. And so you have this account, and you see Saul becoming this impulsive man, this man that's you know, I've got to get this. I got to get these enemies. I got to uh, avenge myself on my enemies. Nobody gets to eat until I avenge myself. Do you guys swear? Do you swear? And he makes everybody swear so he can have vengeance on his enemies. It's a selfish, impulsive man becoming a selfish, impulsive politician, which leads us to the final straw that broke the camel's back, if you will. Verse uh, chapter fifteen. We see Saul moving here from an impulsive politician to a conceited demagogue. Conceited demagogue. Conceited means he's proud. Demagogue means he gets his support by doing what everybody likes. And you see in verse 1 of chapter 15, Samuel also said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hear, heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Why does he say that? Any thoughts? Why does he say, listen, Saul, listen up. God sent me to anoint you, and I want you to listen. Because Saul obviously is not listening. He's not in the habit of listening. Verse 2, thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all they have and do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. This group of people were so wicked they needed to be exterminated, needed to be annihilated. So Saul gathered the people together and he numbers them and he goes and he begins to take action. Drop down to verse 9. But Saul and the people spared Agag, That's the king of the Amalekites and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs and all that was good and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless that they utterly destroyed. They say the writer here says he was unwilling to utterly destroy it, not willing. Samuel comes once again. Samuel always shows up when Saul is in trouble here. And Saul goes out and he puts on a good face before Samuel in uh, verse 13. And Samuel went to Saul and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Had he performed the commandment of the Lord? Absolutely not. But he put on a good face. He was a good politician these days. Samuel says, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And you can actually, if you put yourself here, you can hear it as he says it because as he's speaking, I mean, there's these sheep in the background that won't be quiet. You know, the oxen are lowing and Saul's standing there, you know, with this Cheshire cat grin on his face like everything's fine. There's nothing to see here. And Samuel puts his hand to his ear. What is that I hear? Saul said, verse 15, they have brought them. They have brought, who's they? They have brought them from the Amalekites. Whoever they is, they get in a lot lot of trouble. They get blamed for a lot. They have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God and the rest we have utterly destroyed. So who's he blaming at this point? Blaming his people. Blaming, blame shifting to the people. So Samuel said, When you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? We've come a long way, haven't we? 
when you were little. You remember back there when you were ch- chasing after donkeys, Saul? Do you remember that? When you were hiding under the military equi- equipment, you couldn't stand people looking at you because you were so afraid to be king. You remember that? When you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? I mean, he's... He swoops down. You get the picture of this bird swooping down and grabbing greedily everything. And Saul said to Samuel, But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me and brought Agag, king of Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites, but the people took of the plunder sheep and oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. So he's hedging a little bit, isn't he? He said, well, they should have been utterly destroyed, but, you know, these guys, you know, bless their hearts, you know, they, they just never listened to orders, you know, and they, they're, they, you know, you know, you got to sort of work a little with them. Be patient, Samuel. And Samuel's not buying any of it. Verse 22, so Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. You keep talking about sacrifices, Saul. I would much rather have a king who obeys than a king who sacrifices. And to heed, to listen, than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, He has rejected you from being king. Now this is, I find this astounding. This is really one of the reasons I'm preaching this message here. Verse 24. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in your words. He's like, all right, all right. See his hands, they're up in the air. All right, you got me, you got me. I've sinned. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I feared, because I feared, uh, lost my place, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. He's still blame shifting here, even in his confession. Verse 25, now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. He's like, Samuel, you know, look, see, see the time? We've got we, we to go worship here. So I'm sorry. Hey, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Now help me. Let's go worship the Lord. Come on, Samuel. Come on. And Samuel's not going. Samuel's not going anywhere. Samuel actually turns to go the other way. Verse 27, Saul seized the edge of his robe and it tore. Now he was either wearing some really cheap fabric or Saul had an anger problem. Which do you think it was? I think he had a little bit of a problem. He grabs Samuel and he grabs him in a way that he tears his robe. If you grab somebody and you tear their clothes, I mean, that you, something's going on there, okay? And so he tears his robe. Verse 28, so Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to your neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the strength of Israel will not lie or relent, for he is not a man that he should relent. And then in verse 30, again, I find this astounding. He said, I have sinned. Again, you got me. Yet honor me now, please, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. Samuel? Help me out. I'm sorry, I've sinned, but help me out. I mean, we got to keep a, we got to keep the, got to keep the machine going here. Got to keep a good face. What's he most concerned about at this point? Himself. That's all he's concerned. He is a conceited demagogue. He wants the approval of the people more than he wants the approval of his God. And Samuel goes. Um, so Samuel turned back, verse 31, after Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. Then here's a really awkward moment. Samuel said, bring Agag, king of the Amalekites, here to me. So Agag came to him cautiously, and Agag said, this is the king, surely the bitterness of death is past. But Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. 
That'll, that'll ruin a statement there. That'll ruin the public image. Um, and he does that. Verse 34, Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house at Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death. He never saw Saul again until the day of his death. And the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Now, that's a long journey to the top or bottom, whichever you want to look at it, because Saul's world is upside down. And we find Saul now at the top of the kingdom, but at the bottom as far as the Lord is concerned. Because why? Because God uses people who are small in their own eyes. And there are no exceptions. You will not be the exception to that. I will not be the exception to that. God uses people who are small in their own eyes. Those who are little in their own eyes have the greatest awareness of God. And those who are great in their own eyes have the least awareness of God. And the application here, I hope, is pretty obvious. We haven't spent a lot of time on it, but God's children need to humble themselves through the gospel. Those who are great in their own eyes have the least awareness of God. And you can know if you're great in your own eyes when everything is about you. It's all about, it's all about them. Even your confession is like, yeah, you got me. You got sorry, but let's try to keep a good spin on things and help me keep, keep going this direction. And there's no grief over sin. Everything is about the agenda that you have. Everything is about the way that you're going. It's about pride. It's about your image, about your appearance. It's about your stuff or your reputation, whatever it may be. And I'm including myself in all of this as well. And you see at the end of Saul's life, every time I get to this point, I think, man, Lord, help me to stay away from that. Let me, let me not come into that same tract and slide down that hill pursuing something thinking that it's good and yet it's chasing after my own selfish ambition find yourself at the top only to realize that you're at the bottom what's the remedy what is what's the hope for God's people as they face the danger of thinking too much of themselves let every man among you not think of himself more highly than he ought to think how do we do that? We're told over and over in Scripture that we are to humble ourselves. Humble yourself. And I want to point out that humble yourself sounds like it's your responsibility. It's my responsibility. It means that we stop listening to the conceited messages of your heart. Does your heart talk to you? Do you get annoyed sometimes with your heart when it talks to you? Your heart, my heart, they are so wicked. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart's deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. I mean, desperately wicked. Who can know it? And our heart churns out these utterly spiritually dumb things. And it tells us these dumb things that we tend to believe because we follow after our hearts. And the only way, the only hope for us is to preach the gospel to ourself. Just like you would preach the gospel to a proud person. We were speaking to a man recently and he was saying, he was sort of uh, singing his own praises, if you will. And I don't mean to be unkind, but to look at this fellow, you, it, wasn't, it wasn't obvious that he had done well for himself. He looked the exact opposite. It looked like someone who was really struggling, to be, to be honest. But this man said, I raised my grandchildren. I've got a wife. I've got a house, a job. And he said, I cleaned up my life after being in prison. And he was very proud of that. And, you know, I'm thankful for someone that takes responsibility for themselves. But his conclusion was, I don't need God. I don't even believe in God. I don't need him. What do you say to a person like that? Because a person like that is just a little, a few steps 
removed from where you and I are sometimes in the middle of the week, we tell ourselves, you know, that was really good. You know, that talk that you just gave to your child or that, you know, response that you get, that was really good. And you start to believe things like that or you begin to listen to your own heart and I don't know what the subject matter that your heart gives to you. I know what my heart says to me. And, and we start to listen to ourselves. And we're just like that man, that poor man that met last week and I had to tell him, you know, the, we, the wickedness of our heart. We're all wicked. We need the Lord. And folks, all of us need to say to ourselves today, tomorrow, the next day, when we get up in the morning, fill in your name there, you're a wicked sinner. You deserve to be in hell right now instead of standing in front of this mirror in the bathroom on a Monday morning. You deserve right now to be in hell. You don't deserve the least of God's kindnesses to you. You didn't deserve to get up this morning. You don't deserve to look the way you do. You don't deserve anything. You deserve hell. And left to yourself, you will propagate that selfish, wicked, godless, heathen message to everyone you can because you're proud as a peacock. And you deserve God's wrath. But Jesus Christ has seen your plight. And He took it upon Himself to take on your unrighteous, heathen, godless ways upon Himself. And He took it upon Himself to die on a rugged cross and shed His blood so that you, a wicked, godless, prideful person, can stand in front of this mirror today and say these words to yourself. That's why Jesus died. He died for you. You don't walk away from the mirror a proud person. You walk away from the mirror a person that realizes their place before the Lord. I was driving to the church this morning. I was listening to a particular song. And in the middle of the song, this phrase really has become precious to me this year. It's a simple phrase. It says, great is my sin, greater his love. Great is my sin, greater his love. Have you ever said that to yourself? Great is my sin. Folks, every last one of us in here, I don't care how old you are, every one of us, if we're honest with what, before ourselves, we would have to say, we would have to shout, great is my sin. Great is my sin. But we can also shout, greater his love. The gospel reminds us that without the Lord, we're eternally lost in sin. Saul forgot that. He forgot where he came from. He forgot what he was. He was small in his own eyes over here as he was chasing donkeys around as a, a son of his father. But he goes from being that to this conceited demagogue of a man who's out to please others and polish his self-image. And the simple question today is, where are you? Where am I on that spectrum? Are we great in our own eyes? If you're great in your own eyes today, today, you need the gospel. You may need to believe the gospel for the first time if you're great in your own eyes today. Maybe you've drifted though. Maybe you have believed the gospel. You need to be reminded of the gospel today if you're great in your own eyes. Ask the Lord to make you small in your own eyes and to humble you through the gospel. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the example of Saul. A tragic example of a man who forgot who he was. Lord, may we always remember who we are without Christ and who we are with Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the greatness of your love for us, for the exceeding tenderness of your kindness to reach down and have anything to do with us because of what your Son has done on the cross. Lord, give us humility. May we be a people who don't look to ourselves, but look to you. Who are not proud of what we've done, but who are proud of what you've done. And who think of our God as you ought to be worshipped. 
We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like us to turn to 353. We really need the Lord to search us on this. To search our hearts. To see if there's any wicked way in me. Lead me in the everlasting way. The way everlasting that is the way of freedom. And that's what we're going to sing about. 353, search me, O God, and know my heart today. Let's stand together as we sing. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. Try me, O Savior, know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin and set me free. Sing that last if you would. Lord, take my life and make it missed.